I work at Google. And I'm going to talk about new things to do with billions of words. So at Google, our mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible. And this means a lot of different things. And what I'm going to talk about today is taking billions and billions of words from hundreds of years of books and use those words and tools that we've built to analyze those words to understand culture and technology and language. And we don't do this with any particular application in mind. It's not what we're saying, oh, and this is what we do with it. We're doing it to expand our knowledge of these things. So, for example, we can look at an interesting equation, which I think is getting mangled here, which is applesauce divided by applesauce plus applesauce. And this leads to all sorts of interesting questions, but based on some perplexed looks, perhaps I should back up a little bit. So what, what did we do before? How did we get to actually asking the question about applesauce divided by applesauce plus applesauce? Well, what we did before is we, we, we scanned a jillion books. Um, we OCR'd them, that is, we put them through a computer that would recognize the text in those books. Um, and this was done as part of our search where you can search over Google Books. But then I and a few other engineers, um, Will Brockman, John Orwant, and Yuan Shen, did a 20% project where we said, let's, let's collate these books by publication date. Some of these were published in 1850, 1860, 1920, 1980. Let's organize it and clean up the information about those dates since mistakes are made and whatnot. Then let's slice and dice those um, words from the books in what we call n-grams. An n-gram is one to five words in our case, and it's things like the word dog is a one gram. The word, you know, amazing adventure is a bigram, or the phrase amazing adventure. And then we said, let's build a tool. And with my colleague Will Brockman, we built this tool that lets you visualize how these words are used over time. So this is the word war going from 1900 to 2000 over the span of the 20th century. And what you can see here is, perhaps unsurprisingly, we use the word war a lot more when we are in the middle of a war. You can even see a little hump in the late 60s and early 70s. Now, you might use this to understand things that have happened in history. You might even be able to use it to anticipate certain kinds of changes. And in fact, what we did was we did a lot of science with this. We worked with collaborators at Harvard. There was actually a previous TEDx talk where we talked about our science. And we published a paper in Science Magazine. Go read it. Go watch the YouTube video. They're great. What I'm going to talk about today is cool new things. Some of the cool new things that we've continued to do in our 20% time, and some of the cool new things we can imagine and would like to see people do with the data that we've made available. So let me talk first about some work by Slav Petrov and Yuri Lin, which is we took a part of speech tagger. We said different words have, are used in different contexts. So for example, watch might be a thing on your wrist or watch might be a thing you do. And as you can see from this, which again is, spans the 20th century, the beginning of the 20th century, a watch on your wrist was talked about about as much as watching something. And then you can see around the 50s or the 60s, they started to diverge. There might have been some sort of technological or cultural shift where we started doing a lot more watching and a lot less wearing of watches. But we also said, well, we can do things like use arbitrary standalone tags. So let's just say we want to look at how much words end in prepositions. ADP is an abbreviation that, that includes a class of words that includes prepositions. End says the end of a sentence. And now we can see over the, this is last, last two centuries, we can see that from 1800 to 1900, we sort of had this increase of ending words with prepositions. And thanks to grammarians, school teachers, and others, we've fought back against this, and now we are at an all-time low of ending sentences with prepositions. This is great because this is something we really shouldn't put up with. <laughs> so we can also do math on these phrases. So for example, we can look at the technology of engines. We can say, let's do steam engine divided by engine. And what this means is instead of just saying how much do we talk about engines and steam engines as books, it's we're normalizing one for the other. So you can see in 1850, 7% of mentions of the word engine were preceded by the word steam because steam engines were a big deal. Then gradually over time it faded. 
And in the 20th century, we had this notion of a combustion engine. And we can again see combustion engines per engine. They never became quite as big a deal, at least as a written phrase. But then we see, just in the last 10, 20 years, there's this entirely new kind of engine called a search engine um, that has become a completely new kind of thing. Now, this gets us to applesauce. So, we can look at a question like applesauce divided by applesauce plus applesauce. Now, what, 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 what am I talking about here? So, applesauce can be written as a compound word with, without a space, or it can be written as a pair of words with a space between them. But it turns out applesauce goes up and down over time. And if we just look at the curves, they just go up and down because I guess they're trendy in one decade or not. Um, but if we look at applesauce, one word, divided by applesauce, one word, plus applesauce, two words, we see that something happened and it gradually started shifting. And it went from being a word that almost was never, you know, five or ten percent of the time was it a compound word, to something that is ninety percent of the time a compound word. Now, I don't know if this was caused by a marketing of a product that started to have no space in it, or if it was caused by an influx of German immigrants who were fond of compound words and applesauce. Um, but this is an important kind of actual cultural question for all of its um, sort of interesting humor to it. Um, but we said, great, this is great. You can go and you can go to the Ngram viewer, which we provide on, on Google, and you can do all of these graphs. You want to plot applesauce, you want to plot war, you want to plot something that you want to understand. You want to understand how has the word beatboxing gone from a, a non-compound to compound. You can do that all on the Ngram viewer today, including all of these part of speech tagging and expressions. But we didn't want to stop there. We wanted to say, let's provide the data for other people to do interesting things with it. Um, so there's still interesting science to do. So let's look, for example, we can say, let's analyze the data in the raw and say, what are some old-fashioned words, people don't say maybe thus so much anymore or write it, versus some newfangled phrases that didn't get used much 100 or 200 years ago. And you can see that there's a, a research project here to identify the shift away from this old style language and provide an increased awareness of the evolution of language. You could also do this over shorter windows, over longer windows, within particular subdomains. Another cool thing you can do is you can look at word context over time. So if we take a word like black, and we say, what word comes after black most often in written English? Well, in 1960, it was hair and pants and eyes, because black was a color term. But if you look, the 60s had some major cultural shifts. Things happened in the 60s that caused people to talk about it differently. And by 1970, black was very much a racial term. It was people, man, community. And that has persisted to today. In 2000, it's women, people, man of the same general genre. In contrast, something like blue allows you to say, well, it was eye, sky, and color. And then it became eye, sky, and collar. Blue collar became a phrase. And eye, sky, and jeans in 2000. It's still very much a color word. And the ability to analyze and understand this kind of context allows you to understand cultural and historical trends. So you can also look at how language itself changes instead of culture or technology. You can say, what are some words that have become adjectives over time? Amateur, key, disabled, verbs, handle, shout, want, or things that have become nouns, repair, paint, and flow. So for example, you can see with want. Again, we use a nice little formula here. We say want underscore verb, which is say want used as a verb, divided by the uses of want as a verb and a noun together. And we see at this extreme, it would be never being used as a verb. And at this extreme, it's only being used as a verb. And what we see is that today, it is almost entirely used as a verb. But merely 200 years ago, it was used predominantly as a noun. People would talk about having a want. So this led me to yield a, a, an important and hopefully useful to use slide. So I don't know if you deal with um, marketing people or product managers very often, but occasionally I get asked for an ask. Oh, I have an ask for you. Well, this is the graph that I show under those circumstances. You can say you have a want. It's less common, but you can't say you have an ask. It's not a noun. All right. Then we look at our friend Randall Monroe of XKCD. He took our data and said, let's look at the details of the word sustainable. It's on an exponential growth path. And this is a log plot. And he noticed that we've ha we're you know, headed towards more and more use of the word sustainable. In fact, in a mere you know, 25 years, we're going to have sustainable on, on average on every page of a book. And 50 years, we're going to have sustainable on 
every sentence on average once. And then in less than 100 years, books will simply be the word sustainable, repeated over and over and over again, so they're going to be very easy to write. Now, of course, this is humor, but at the same time, this trend, this notion of don't just analyze the data to get the numbers of where they are today, but use it to predict the future. Well, we're not sure that you can use this always to predict the future. And in, in the extreme extrapolation, you certainly can't. But if you look, there's definitely the ability to understand how some of the way people talk about things, the way people write about things, forecasts what's actually going to happen. Finally, I want to talk about something that's a little less science, but is fun. A Markov generator is a thing where you just generate random babble, probabilistically. So for example, if you have a phrase, when you, you might say, what comes after that? You might say, when you go, or when you come, or when you see, or any number of things like that. So we wrote a computer program that will randomly pick one of the words that we know comes after when you, and say we say, when you see. We, now we randomly pick a word that comes after you see. You might say, you see that, et cetera, et cetera. And that's fun. It yields all sorts of babble. But what we can do is we can actually generate babble in the style of 1845. When you shall be sufficiently hard to please him, but I think we may think proper. And you probably could make a TED talk out of these. But, you know, when you last year that they are in and looked about him with satisfactory returns. These are very old-fashioned language. So if you wanted a more modern kind of talk, you could go with when you deal with every stroke of business ability in various trades, or when you need to file a comment on current thinking, or more recently, when you only need to have been extensively investigated for the, and I don't know what we need to be investigated for, so, but someone should make a toy for us to say, generate random text. You could use larger Markov chains to get things more sensible, or all sorts of things. So, what I want you to do is I want you to go play with this. I want you to make discoveries and find out things that we may not have known before. We have billions and billions of words from hundreds of years of books. We have all of this data, and there's a lot to be discovered out there. If you are a software engineer or a scientist, whether amateur or professional, you can download this data and do a bunch of the science yourself, and then perhaps equally important to me, is I want someone to tell me what abruptly triggered the applesauce compoundification in 1924, because I really looked and I couldn't figure it out. Thank you very much.